Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To my loyal bed crimers, hi there. How you doing? Hope you're having a great day. To anyone new, a warm welcome. Thank you for showing up at my channel and checking it out. Let me just ask that if you find value in the video or if you enjoy it, please just hit the like button after you watch it. Now, let's dig in. Everybody's looking for love, right? Love is all you need. At least that's what they keep telling you. So why should you be any different? You have needs too. So you just sit in your room and scroll through Facebook or Insta or talk and there they all are. It might as well be Tinder. All of them looking so pretty. And here's the best part. They don't have any idea you're staring at them, following their every post, checking out every move they make, every tasty smile flash. It's your reassuring secret. Because if they don't know, they can't turn you down. There's no one smirking, telling you to get real, dude. There's no one telling you to get lost. So you just keep looking and looking and looking. And you keep thinking, I want it. I want it. I want it. Only you know what they're thinking? You can't have it. Want to bet? Those words are not my words. They belong to reporter Howard Bloom. And they are the introduction to his latest article on the Idaho case. Bloom writes for Airmail magazine, and this is his third tome of his three-part series on the case. In this latest article, Bloom talks about the role that social media may have played in the crime. Bloom writes, and I quote, We are living through one of the first major crime stories of the social media age. And the internet, for better or worse, has changed the narrative. End quote. Bloom writes that at precisely 8.57 p.m. on the last full day of her life, Kaylee Gonsalves was in the midst of a busy Saturday. Per Bloom, Kaylee paused before going out for an evening at the Corner Club Bar in downtown Moscow, Idaho, with her best friend, Maddie Mogan. We're aware that Kaylee posted a series of photos to her Instagram account, which she captioned, One lucky girl to be surrounded by these people every day. We all saw those photos of the joyful-looking students taken on the back patio of the off-campus house in Moscow. It's hard to believe that within hours, four of those students would no longer be breathing. Listen to what Bloom wrote about that now infamous back porch photo. In the photo, there are the six of them posing on a narrow porch in the bright autumnal light. Yet the arrangement, however haphazard, has the intimations of a deliberate iconography. It might as well be a foretelling of what is to come. For at each end of the row, as if bookends to the main drama, are the two young women who will be the sole survivors of the carnage that is inexorably approaching, while at center stage directly in the camera's eye are the four victims. And here, too, the seeming predictive power of the images is unnerving." End quote. Wow. Just wow. He's right. The two survivors are like bookends to the victims in that photo. Bloom goes on to talk about Instagram. It, like Facebook, Snapchat, and TikTok, is a shout out to the world. Like, look at me, here I am, this is where I live. Bloom points out that one of the warnings to be gleaned from this case might very well be that it would be prudent to remember that open society has its enemies. Bloom writes, and I quote, a joyful instance of self-affirmation can reverberate in some forlorn minds as a taunt, end quote. I think that's exactly what happened with Koberger and the female students. It was an impossible dream. They were beyond his grasp. Bloom likens the pretty females to forbidden fruit for someone like Brian Koberger. Bloom writes, and I quote, 
and if it has been decreed that this bounty will always be dangling maddeningly out of reach a deranged mind may decide to axe down the tree End quote. the idea that koberger was tracking his victims on social media remains conjecture at this point bloom says that if we find out that social media did indeed play a part in motivating the perpetrator to set out on this destructive course, then a warning label needs to be posted on the portals of all these sites, and it should read, Take heed all who enter here. Bloom then points out that social media has also been helpful in this case. The Moscow Police Department posted notices asking for information about the events and people involved in the crime. The post read, whether you believe it is significant or not, you might possess the piece of the puzzle that helps investigators solve these murders. Bloom writes that nearly 20,000 clues poured in, and at least one of the tips helped change everything. It was from that gas station attendant who spent many hours watching surveillance video and she's the one who found a white Hyundai Elantra speeding by in the early morning hours on the day of the crime. It's true that the police asked the public, including internet sleuths, to become detectives on this very real case. Bloom then brings up Lataw County Judge Megan Marshall, who issued the gag order back on January 3rd of 2023 after Koberger was arrested. That first gag order restricted prosecutors, the defense, law enforcement, and other officials from speaking about the case publicly. Two weeks later, Marshall made the gag order even more far-reaching. She expanded its scope to the survivors and their attorneys, as well as to the victims' families and their attorneys. The result is that 22 news organizations have united to ask for a repeal of the order. For now, we await word from Judge Marshall. Bloom is concerned that if the media cannot speak out about the case, then what he describes as the Wild West of the Internet will, and more people like that female TikToker who accused a female professor at the University of Idaho of being the perpetrator will crawl out of the woodwork and create more chaos. Bloom ends the article with some beautiful writing. Take a listen. Yet faced with all these reportorial obstacles, I search on nevertheless for cornerstones of unimpeachable evidence. And so I find myself returning to the photo Kaylee posted of her friends on the last full day of her too brief life. In one way, the image provides a sort of solace, like the figures that a young John Keats viewed, and on a Grecian urn, and despite that sad fate that is poised to descend on them, the beauty of the four friends now cannot fade. Forever they too will love and be fair, and they too will stay forever young. I like this Howard Bloom. He's a hella good writer. He gives me goosebumps. What do you guys think? Until the next time, I'm Bed Crime Stories. Hey, do me a favor. Smash that like button, and I'll see you next time.